What sort of a financial deal should Obama be seeking to strike when he travels to China next month? No, I think this would be the time because you really need to bring China into the creation of a new uh, 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 world order. Well, how do you like them apples? That is Christia Freeland, Canada's Deputy Prime Minister now, Minister of Finance, and she happens to be on the Board of Trustees of the World Economic Forum. You know, people that say, you'll own nothing and be happy. In 2030, I guess, the Great Reset, Build Back Better. Oh, it's going to be so green. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, across our beautiful country of Canada, our friends south of the border, in the United States of America, across the pond in Europe, Africa, Middle East, Asia, Central America, South America, New Zealand, Australia. Man, I'm getting heat exhaustion now. It's a third day of August 2021. There's the happy faces. Who wants to be a billionaire? Who flew on Jeffrey Epstein's plane before Epstein committed suicide in prison because the guards were not present and the person in his cell was out and uh, the cameras were broken? Oh man, I hate it when you got stuff like that all lined up because some people think there's a conspiracy involved. Anyway, Bill Gates did fly a few times with uh, Jeffrey Epstein. Bill Gates happens to be the biggest farmland owner in the United States of America. Plus, he's got his fingers in so many other things, such as vaccinations, big pharma, and you name it. Now, George Soros, on the other hand, he's just your typical butthole. Now, I know he's Hungarian, but that does not mean anything to me. There are buttholes in Hungary, there are numbnuts, there's criminals, you name it. But Soros is at the very top. Unfortunately, you're not going to see our media saying too much about him. you got to go somewhere different. George Soros. Does that name ring a bell? I'm sure it does. If you take interest in global trends, popular culture or geopolitics, you may have definitely come across this name. Let's put a face to it. This is the man we're talking about. He is George Soros, arguably one of the most controversial figures in the world. With as many supporters as detractors, there are reports celebrating his philanthropy, also those questioning his ideas about the world. For some people, Soros is a legend, a financial guru, one of the most successful investors of all time. Yet some believe he's a man of malicious influence, a billionaire who is able to move markets, someone who can sway politics and opinion. So who is the real Soros? And why is he such a polarizing figure? Hello and welcome to Gravitas Plus. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. Have you ever heard of Black Wednesday? It refers to an event in September 1992 when George Soros and a group of investors forced Britain to withdraw its pound from the European Exchange Rate Mechanism, ERM. In other words, they forced the pound out of existence. How is this done? Soros placed an enormous bet against the British pound. He said it would sink below the lowest currency exchange limit. More investors placed their bets assuming this would happen. Their actions put a lot of pressure on the pound. It sank further, ultimately pushing the United Kingdom out of the ERM. OK, thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, we. Uh, George's team felt that the space was not really conducive to Q&A because it's such a long haul. So it's just going to be me asking George questions, and I'm going to try to channel all the questions that everyone would have wanted me to ask. You can yell at me afterwards if I don't ask the right ones. All of these investors made money, up to $300 million, but Soros was the winner, earning $1.5 billion in just one month. This score earned him legendary status and boosted his firm's wealth to $7 billion. They started calling him the man who broke the Bank of England. Today they call him a master manipulator of the global order, an unregulated billionaire with a messiah complex. Some say he can bring down not just currencies but entire systems. Some accusations are indeed far-fetched, but they say there's no smoke without fire. So even if these are exaggerations, what are they based on? Let's look at how much this man is worth. 
Soros is among the 10 richest hedge fund managers in the world with an estimated worth of $8.6 billion. Some say he's worth way more than this given the suspiciously enormous sums of money he gives away for charitable causes. He's donated more than $32 billion to a foundation he runs, out of which $15 billion have been distributed in 37 countries. What is this money being used for? For education programs, health camps, human rights movements, justice reform, global governance, and quote unquote, the furtherance of democracy. How is this done? Through the Open Society Foundation, a name inspired from a 1945 book, The Open Society and Its Enemies. This body is headquartered in New York, and has active programs in more than 60 countries, this group gives major grants to organizations and parties that are aligned with its mission and objectives, basically anybody who seeks to shake up the status quo. In Israel, the only democracy in West Asia, the list of grantees of the OSF include a number of Israeli NGOs that deny the legitimacy of Israel. In Palestine, OSF funds NGOs like the al Haq and Palestinian Center for Human Rights, both of which are associated with the Popular Front, an outfit designated as a terrorist organization by the US, the EU, Canada and Israel. What would you call George Soros then? A political activist? Why not? In September 2012, he donated $1 million to a political action committee led by Barack Obama. In 2016, he was the biggest donor to the Hillary Clinton campaign, giving almost $8 million. The move was met with a lot of criticism. He also donated £400,000 to anti-Brexit groups opposing Britain's exit from the European Union but favoured Germany leaving the EU back in 2013. He's a man of convictions and contradictions. In June 2018, Hungary, which happens to be his native country, passed a law dedicated to this man. It's called the Stop Soros Law, aimed at ending OSF funding to organisations that support illegal entry of undocumented migrants. The OSF calls this law authoritarian. Hungary says it is only safeguarding national security. Now here's the thing, promoting and funding reform in a system is one thing, but undermining a nation's sovereignty by influencing decisions is quite another. George Soros and the OSF seek to liberate the world from ideas they consider outdated and restraining. They want to change political realities that are not suitable to their principles. Take their activism in India, for example. In January 2020, Soros unveiled a plan to set up a $1 billion fund to build a global network of higher educational institutions. Institutions that will help students put up a resistance against growing nationalism. He singled out several countries and their leaders. India was one of them. He called India a Hindu nationalist state, which is suffering the biggest and most frightening setback. The biggest and most frightening setback occurred in India, where the democratically elected Narendra Modi created a Hindu nationalist state. This was last year. This year, a scandal hit India, the Pegasus Project. It suggested that the government of India was spying on its citizens. The report had a list of 300 odd Indians. Who was behind this project? 17 media organizations and two global entities, Amnesty International and Forbidden Stories, they're both beneficiaries of grants and funds from the Open Society Foundation. In 2018, Amnesty received a 137,000 euro grant from the OSF for a campaign to repeal a law Ireland had passed. In June 2021, just a month before the Pegasus report came out, Open Society Foundation named the former Secretary General of Amnesty as its Vice President for Global Affairs. Then we have Forbidden Stories. It has been proven to receive funds from the US State Department. And guess who do they feature as a supporter on their website? The Open Society Foundation. Here's something else that you must know. Sherpa, a French NGO, which is a persistent litigator in India's Rafale deal with France, has also been a recipient of indirect funds from the OSF through a third party. Simply put, a revolving door spins between these NGOs and the offices of George Soros. The same goes for media organizations involved in this project. The Media Research Center, an American media watchdog established in 1987, says 30 American news organizations have links to George Soros, and most of them were part of the Pegasus project. The project itself is under investigation in many countries. At some point, India too will have to specify its position on surveillance and clear the air on whether it uses softwares like Pegasus. In the meantime, can this nexus between news organizations and George Soros be ignored? Can these links be dismissed as a baseless conspiracy theory? 
I don't think so. A billionaire is using his power, influence and yes, his money to make media networks shape narratives across countries and to go after establishments that don't match his vision of the world. Is Hungary, the birthplace of George Soros, the only European country that snoops on its citizens? It was the only one out of 44 European countries to feature in the Pegasus list. Where are Britain and Germany? Where is the United States, the biggest snooper of them all? Are we to believe no one is spied on in these countries? That said, Pegasus is just one piece of this puzzle. The Western media in cahoots with organizations like Open Society have had a long habit of cancelling the so-called third world countries, countries like India in particular. They see India as a metaphor for intolerance, orthodoxy, ignorance, poverty. Let me show you a few examples of this cancel culture. August 2019, when India revoked Article 317 in Kashmir, the New York Times said, bloodshed is all but certain. Note the confidence with which this assertion was made. It's been two years. What happened to their prophecy? The BBC, its terminology on Kashmir, IOK, Indian Occupied Kashmir. Would they call Northern Ireland, British Occupied Ireland? Not in this lifetime. The trend is evident. India is seen through filters of bias. Reports based on conjecture indulge in fear-mongering. The idea is not to convey facts or developments. The idea is to validate and propagate prejudice. Why is that only certain points of view from India get featured in opinion pieces? Why are writers selected based on their position against the current dispensation? Why are only organizations with a certain leaning made part of global investigations? They accuse others of bias. What about their own? Look at this headline from 2013, when at least 24 American journalists were given positions in the Obama administration. This included the managing editor of the Time magazine, the national security editor of the Washington Post, a Los Angeles Times columnist, a reporter from the New York Times, a political producer from CNN, and many others, some of whom are also part of the Biden administration. It gets murkier as you dig deeper. There's certainly a nexus that operates to alter political realities the world over, a nexus that runs from the political corridors of liberal powers to the many offices of the Open Society Foundation across the world. And every time this nexus is called out, its ecosystems go on a one-sided rant devoid of facts. Here's wishing them a busy weekend. Well, there's two more days till Sky News gets back on YouTube. In the meantime, Gravitas Vion is doing a phenomenal job of covering stuff. I said that uh, as soon as I came across them. Absolutely great reporting. And they're also touching things that our crooked, lying piece of crap mainstream media doesn't do. Which means that sooner or later they will also pay the price of being shut down, locked down, suspended for a week here, suspended for a week there. Because Basically, what you're seeing is that the elite do not want people to have a voice. They want just one ideology. That's globalist liberal. And if you don't support that, uh, your days are numbered, buddy. Anyway, George Soros, Justin Trudeau, Christia Freeland, all cut from the same cloth, except Soros is the ringleader. And Freeland and uh, Trudeau are the clowns. They're the clown shit show, at least that's the way I see it.